Good morning. Welcome back to Digital Perspectives, everybody. I hope everyone in the U.S. Uh, had a happy fourth and safe uh, holiday. Uh, let's get into this thing. So we're going to play a couple videos for you. One is early days of Ripple. Greg Kidd giving a speech about what Ripple is and the technology. And it's quite compelling knowing where we are today in this moment. Then we're going to hear a little clip from Augustine Karstens from Bank of International Settlements and that continued conversation we've been having about BIS and the Fed that have made a strategic partnership to foster innovation, which is pretty fascinating words right there. Okay, and then another piece of news we're going to look at is Visa seeking developers that are familiar with the Ethereum, R3, Ripple, Bitcoin, and that is a pretty compelling argument. I think all these things actually link together, and we'll remark on that in the end. So let's go ahead and get into this thing. The first clip is the Greg Kidd piece. Let's listen to this. Um, shout out to Real XRP Boy for this, and, and let's listen. This is just a great clip, so let's just hear it here. Ripple Labs is based in San Francisco and employs a team of 95 men and women with experience in government and regulation, finance, and technology. Their previous experience includes Federal Reserve, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the NSA, Goldman Sachs, Deloitte, Apple, and Google. Our goal is to create faster, safer, and more efficient payment systems domestically and across international borders. In my view, a large portion of today's inefficiencies and in payments stem from antiquated infrastructure. In many countries, the technology underpinning payments was last updated in the 1970s and was not designed with interoperability in mind. Because systems are not compatible, banks have to rely on a patchwork of intermediaries to move funds, a process which introduces risk, delays, and costs. Ripple Labs aims to improve payments by offering modern, interoperable payment infrastructure for registered financial institutions, clearing houses, and central banks. As Ripple is payment technology for financial institutions, consumers may never know their transactions are being sent through Ripple, just as they have little to no knowledge of the ACH and wire rails that facilitate their payments today. Our technology is designed to minimize payment and counterparty risk, reduce costs, and enable connectivity between banks and payment networks. Before discussing the technology we use, I want to highlight that Ripple's technology fully complements existing regulations. Mm. When using Ripple, a financial institution's responsibility for OFAC reporting, anti-money laundering, compliance, know your customer requirements, and other regulatory reporting stays fully intact, just as with existing payment rails. This reflects Ripple Labs' view that ensuring robust security, consumer protections, now look, let let's uh let's go back to around here and let this play here because there's a piece I want to talk banks. about with you. As Ripple is payment technology for financial institutions, consumers may never know their transactions are being sent through Ripple. There you go. Consumers may never know. Now, there's a million things he said in just two minutes and 20 seconds. That's just incredible. And we could spend all, taking it, all day taking it apart. I'm not going to. But in the very beginning, I mean, he laundry lists the level of people that are really at Ripple that have come together. I mean, the NSA, like David Schwartz, you know, the Federal Reserve himself, you know, Deloitte and all these other major companies where you could see collectively the people that had united to work on such a thing were really coming from within the system. And then he goes on to further say that this would work back in. Consumers, for the most part, wouldn't even realize what's actually taking place because of the interoperability and how it solves the problem, just like do an ACH payment rail. So, you know, it's just pretty remarkable. And then when he really remarks even further here, if we go a little further, 
and he talks about this. Trying to minimize payment and counterparty risk, reduce costs, and enable connectivity between banks and payment networks. Before discussing the technology we use, right I here. want to highlight that Ripple's technology fully complements existing regulations. Boom. Just like when Brad Garlinghouse said at the uh, Economic Breakfast or Economic Club, the New York thing that he did uh, last year, I believe it was, and he remarked that we're already behind the firewall with the banks. Really? Because they're already in compliance. Everything they've done is about being in compliance with the current existing system and regulatory structure. So in fact, when you think about the ripple drop we played just the other day with Chris Larson, where he's asked about clarity, and he says that's the key word, clarity not necessarily more regulation because he understands they're already compliant. So what does clarity really mean? Clarity to me really means at this point a designation that XRP is actually a currency. All right, now, taking that clip and knowing we got that clip let's move here and listen to augustine carson's really talk about the whole bailing out of the system and the companies and not retreating from lending during this crisis let's listen to this the nature of the crisis is completely unprecedented the way it was generated, and also the globality of it, how it was major crisis uh, with a simultaneous impact in pretty much all the countries of the world. As very opportune, very quick, very bold. Uh, I think that it was uh, tra tailored uh, precisely to, to what uh, this type of crisis required. There are some comparisons in our uh, report where we where we show that uh, some of the programs implemented by some central banks are pretty much of the same magnitude or the same scope than what they were implemented in the GFC, with the difference that in the GFC took them for probably two to three years to deploy all those programs, and this was just a matter of months. But to give credit to central banks, uh, they also developed new ones uh, at record speed. Typically, during a financial crisis, you would expect prudential authorities to ask banks to reduce exposures and to build capital. Listen. In this crisis, they did precisely the opposite. They asked banks to keep lending uh, and in the process to use the buffers, the capital buffers that we had accumulated since the great financial crisis. And the reason to do that is basically to make sure that by keeping uh, the credit flowing, that the private sector, households and in particular corporations in this case, would be able to survive, therefore reducing at the end of the day the exposure that banks are facing. It is a to be anticipated that there will be some solvency issues and that could put some stress on the financial system. So they need to be very aware of these issues. And part of the solution will require further uh, cooperation and coordination with fiscal authorities. Okay, so here we hear them basically saying, you know, hey, we're the heroes here because we didn't stop lending during this crisis. Normally, that's what we would do. You circle the wagons, you lock the doors, and you tell everybody, sorry, can't help you, pass or fail. You know what I mean? You're out of here. <clears throat> Instead, what they've done is say that we've asked and, and we've taken the road that we've continued to lend through this crisis in hopes that they're going to lend their way out of this crisis because they're saying the economy was shut down, the globality, which I didn't even realize was a word, 
but because of the global size of this problem that the economy was deliberately shut down, basically, that they know that they can lend their way out of the problem because they're going to turn the lights back on everywhere. I have to say, I think they realize that it's not that simple either. Look, there's a lot of people who have lost their businesses. You know, the the people that really got hurt out here are the business owners, the ones that were struggling to keep the place open and to keep people employed. And when something like this happened, which was absolutely unforeseen to the level of shutting down an economy deliberately, which Jerome Powell, by the way, last week admitted, thanks to Frank Lavelli, who caught that and sent it out to us, you know, it confirmed a deliberate shutdown, which we all knew. But understanding that and knowing that a lot of the small business owners really are the ones that took the hit. Because they didn't have enough flow, enough money or enough liquidity in their business to be able to sit it out on the sideline and just pay bills on their restaurant business or whatever that company is and the the mortgage or the lease or whatever it is on all the equipment on all the trucks and, and, and all of these things that they had to incur for three to four months with the doors shut. So now we're in a situation where, you know, you see the early days, Greg Kidd laying down what the goal is. You see a health crisis and an economic crisis, which, by the way, was here well before the pandemic. Let's not get it twisted. But now we see even the central bank of central banks using the pandemic as the narrative of why we've had such an issue. I just feel like, you know... Everything now is about the pandemic and less about the economic problems and the liquidity issue that the globe had before the pandemic got here. And I feel like that's one of the reasons that we know that some of this has been played up to illustrate that fact when really there was a twofold problem. There is a pandemic and there is a real global uh, liquidity crisis that was happening before it got here. However, I digress. Let's listen to another one of these clips here from Real XRP Boy from back in uh, uh, 2015 and then 2017 comment from Miguel Viez, who used to be at Ripple here. Shout out to both of them. They're amazing. So let's listen to this clip here because this really does lay it down. So let's check this out. Well, so the, the, when XRP was created, this actually was created before Ripple existed. The creators of XRP decided there'd be 100 billion units because they saw it as a, you know, rather than having a smaller number with a very high price, they saw it as something they wanted to be a, effectively a global reserve currency. Huh. There you go. A global reserve currency. Maybe for a liquidity crisis, maybe for a pandemic crisis. I'm not saying they knew these things, but obviously they understood early, early on that there would be this moment. And I believe that they understood that because of the last great recession we were in back in 08. They learned from there and you know, by 2012, they really, you know, Ripple started working. And then by 2015, you got Brad Garlinghouse up here standing, delivering that message. And to back that up, Andres, Andres Lundberg shares this popular comment that we all know and love from Miguel Viez in 2017. Most importantly, we remain more committed than ever to the simple goal of making XRP the world reser- world's reserve digital currency. The simple goal, and I don't mean simple as in it's easy to do. I mean simple as simply understood that this is what it's for. Now, in the face of all of this and revisiting these clips, I just want to touch on the fact that we're seeing CBDCs be developed, right? We are seeing a strategic partnership between the Fed and the BIS, the biggest central bank with the central bank of central banks, to foster innovation for fintech. That's what the relationship's about. So, again, you know, banks are not one to 
foster or deal with innovation in anything and to see them doing that is highly suggestive okay then moving on to this shout out to mac attack xrp visa seeks ethereum ripple and developers for global blockchain payments well you start thinking rubber on the road meets the road boots on the ground what does this thing have to look like for you know this back end thing that greg kidd's talking about that could work for a payment system you know you start looking at things like this let's take a look at this it's a very quick read here so a job uh, posting on visa's new zealand site is seeking developers with experience of ethereum it verts state that visa is looking for developers to help build a new global uh, blockchain payments network visa's a new initiative looks to set leverage hyperledger blockchain technology Visa is on the lookout for Ethereum developers to help build a global blockchain payments network, according to a recent job advertisement by the payment processing giant on its New Zealand site. The company is looking for strong developer experience with Ethereum and blockchain architecture to join its global commercial payments team working on distributed applications. Our ideal candidate has built and released distributed application and has worked with Ripple R3 ethereum and or blockchain bitcoin blockchain and has experience with solidity state the ad all right so is visa using ethereum successful applicants will be tasked with working with visa's generically titled non-card based payment innovation and product despite the advertisement's apparent focus on developers with experience of ethereum visa's blockchain payments product may not be using ethereum technology nor will it necessarily use ripple or bitcoin also named in the ad one of the five one of visa's five stated priority verticals for the global commercial payments team is listed as hyperledger chain code development in golang also one of the primary responsibilities listed in the job posting is to maintain firm's relationship with hyperledger initiative you can see the five bullet points here where it says blockchain based cross-border payment platform near time settlement uh enterprise id stamping to create a uh, digital identity for corporates hyperledger chain code development in golang and analytics and data visualization Hyperledger, by the way, is an open source umbrella project of multiple blockchain technologies and tools created by Linux Foundation in 2016. Hyperledger is primarily focused on building permissioned enterprise grade blockchain technologies for use of private businesses and corporations. The initiative received financial backing of IBM Intel soon after its inception. The Solidly programming language, also named in the ad, is primarily used to create smart contracts on Ethereum. R3, meanwhile, is an open source blockchain project aimed at creating permission blockchains for private enterprises similar to Hyperledger. I want to remind everybody at this point, R3, Ethereum, and a couple others were tested by NIST. NIST is a National Institute of Standards and Technology. It is the entity that tests all innovation of technology before it is basically adopted by governments. R3 was the winner in that report. Visa's apparent focus on leveraging permission blockchain technology could be inter uh, interpreted as a lack of faith in public blockchains. Hyperledger's documentation describes the benefits of using private permission blockchains in the business sector it states uh per participants on permission permission network are known to one another and therefore have an intrinsic intrinsic interest in participating in the consensus making process this community of participants want to share data with greater degree of security this isn't the first time visa has tapped the blockchain developer pool in 2019, the company posted an ad seeking a product manager to oversee development of fintechs that support digital currencies. So Visa is well underway for what they're doing. And I think we all realize that. The other thing I wanted to highlight is about the NIST report that came out uh, several months ago. It might even either the first of this year I covered that or it was late last year. So, uh, But at any rate, I want to cover the fact that not only did R3 pass with fine colors, but it was really due to the programming language 
that they were using, and I don't remember what it, whether it was Java or what it, whatever it was at the time, but um, I do know that NIST remarked that the programming language is what made it most suitable as R3 to be the winner of that particular thing. The other thing I want to highlight, too, is that does not mean that something like Hyperledger or some project like that is going to lose, and I don't believe that it is. Uh, it just really suggests that for this moment today, R3 was the winner in that particular uh, paper by NIST. All right. The other thing I wanted to say, too, is, is that they did highlight in that report from the National Institute of Standards and Technology that Ethereum, although using the Golang uh, programming language, looked to be something that could be compatible and certainly used, but there was some kind of a hurdle between that language and some other uh, computer language being used. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on these things, but we have to understand that there are going to be many many different winners in this space and i'm not suggesting anything here is financial advice obviously this is for educational purposes only and i just want to share the fact that the nist report did not rule out the other co or other coins and tokens and and uh protocols that were looked at as losers either just that the disparity between some of the programming languages to what is actually being used today all right so all in all, when I look at these things, I hear about the, you know, final destination is to be a global reserve currency, whether it's from Brad or whether it's from uh, Miguel Viez, formerly of Ripple. Um, it's exciting, right? I mean, and to know where we are to this day, I know a lot of people are really, really focused on price. I'll tell you what I'm focused on. I'm focused on adoption. I'm focused on market infrastructure. That's what adoption really looks like in its early days. How do you get that to happen? Well, you got to have the visas of the world begin to build the network, the market infrastructure to connect to this new opportunity that exists. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Hit the like and subscribe and share this with somebody you know. I'll catch you all in the next one.